What is up, Nets world? We're back here on the Believe in Nets podcast on the Believe Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host, Eric Slater, Brooklyn Nets beat reporter for ClutchPoints.com. Big thanks to all of you for listening. If you don't already, make sure to subscribe to Believe in Nets on all streaming platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Also subscribe to my YouTube channel at Eric Slater NBA, where I'll be posting all of these episodes and other content. Smash that like button. Leave a five-star review if you can. It really goes a long way. But on today's episode, I was joined by Doug Norty and Adam Armbrecht, also known as the Locked On Nets podcast. We debated the question, where the hell are the Nets going with this roster? Are they staying competitive and going all in on a star trade in the near future? Are they looking to blow it up? What could both of those routes look like? We also talked, touched on Nick Claxton's free agency and some other topics. Hope you guys really enjoyed the debate with Doug and Adam after the theme music. And I'm joined now by Doug Norrie and Adam Armbrecht, two guys who through the dead period of the Brooklyn Nets offseason are just cranking out podcasts. Fellas, how are you? Appreciate you coming on to talk some Nets hoops with me. Excellent, man. Happy to be here. Yeah, can't can't wait. You know us, like just every single day on the grind. So talking more Nets yep. is kind of just uh, how the job goes here. For those of you who aren't following Doug and Adam on the Locked On Nets podcast, the volume of content in a period where there's not much if any next news coming out has been nothing short of incredible so go there if you want next content multiple times a week and really analyzing all storylines involving the nets from two guys who have been plugged in for a long time but today we're not going to waste any time getting into this we're here to answer the age old or it seems like year and a half old question now ever since the kb and kyrie trades what the hell are the Brooklyn Nets going to do with this roster? And we're going to talk about what we think they should do. And then we're going to talk about what we think they will do. So, you know, it seems like for a while there's been two paths when analyzing the question that really both have Mikhail Bridges at the center. The first being keep Bridges and move forward with the Phoenix draft picks and all the other picks you have, plus a huge chunk of cap space you'll create next offseason when Ben Simmons' contract expires, and then use that attempt to find one or more stars to build a contending roster. The second, trade Mikhail Bridges, most likely to the Houston Rockets, who have been showing interest in him, dating back to the trade deadline, get your picks back, and then likely trade your remaining veterans, go into a full reset with control of your future. We also got a report about a month ago that the Rockets were also interested in swapping the Nets picks for the Suns picks. So that's another framework with Houston that would allow them to regain pick control while potentially keeping bridges. But fellas, when you look at those two paths, I know, you know, there's a difference between what's good for the podcast that we do versus what's good for the team long-term. But when you guys are analyzing it, say as Nets fans, when taking a long-term vision of what's going to maximize our chances of doing a podcast during a championship parade on Atlantic <laughs> Avenue in the future, <laughs> what do you think the Nets should be doing here? Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this a lot, Eric, in terms of of where all these paths that they can choose from this offseason and really over the last year and a half or so, going back to different trade deadlines as well. What they should do if it's Houston and we're talking about getting back their own pick control and we're talking about maybe getting even more, a young player potentially in a Mikhail Bridges trade, do it. Do do whatever move takes away veteran older players, gets you back your own pick control and sets you up to rebuild now. And that's not because we don't enjoy competitive basketball, although Brooklyn offered that last season and failed to reach that mark. It's just that you are not going to be in a even mid-tier competitive window going all the way into the 2025 offseason when maybe you can land a bigger star. Maybe you can bring in players. But I still have a hard time seeing this version of this roster being ultimately high-level competitive in the Eastern Conference. So, you know, short-term mid-level success versus long-term sustainability, that's the path that I would go with it. And if Houston's willing to have that conversation, I think Brooklyn should definitely be engaging with them. I've kind of gone back and forth on this. And I actually, I was like, came out leading, I feel like leading the charge of like, blow it up, get your own picks, tank, and we'll see you in five years. And and we'll just live through the, 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 the content nonsense of whatever that would be. And always making the point that like, hey, no one gets hurt worse 
than the content people. I, I, <laughs> does anyone think about the content people? Like, like yeah. you know, it's monetarily a massive disaster to go into a tank where, where the team could be really, really bad. So I always try to like caveat that. But I actually, the, over the last couple months, and maybe it's just me taking some copium, but the I do feel like this other path where leaving the window just open enough for the 2025 cap space on the dream that one of these guys or two of these guys might shake, shake loose. Not probably the same as Kyrie and KD, but somewhere somewhat similar. Like it's like one in free agency and one through a trade and you still have bridges. I don't know. I, I'm I'm a, a more open to the possibility of that even happening. And if it doesn't still maybe clawing back some value on bridges after the fact, even if it's not where it is now. Right. And so I think that like that is not because they do have some ass. They do have some flexibility lined up for 25 strategically mm -hmm. that could make that happen. And if they had to trade bridges for 75 cents in the dollar rather than like a dollar 10 or something, then that I don't know. I, I, I've talked myself a little bit more into that path. And maybe that's just me siding a little more with the front office and and like i said taking taking some <laughs> some coping mechanisms but i don't know so I, yeah i was really hard i was i was hard charging on the blow it up but i, I think i've kind of walked back that that back a little bit yeah i've kind of fallen kind of what you just said doug i've kind of fallen into that where initially i was looking at it and i was saying you know so many things have to break right you know in this potential path for the nets like you're telling yourself a really good story of a lot of things that are going to have to go your way in order to build a contending roster. So initially early on, I was, you know, more so into the fully, like if Houston's going to offer you this trade, you got to do it. I mean, like they're giving you a get out of jail free card, which in the NBA we know is that almost never happens. Like this is a very, very rare opportunity, but you know, I've analyzed it from some different lenses in like recent weeks and months and I, I have been able, like, it hasn't been too hard for me to squint. You know, I don't have to squint too hard to see how Marks and the Nets could be looking at this in terms of that next path. And a lot of that, you know, I just wrote an article about the new television deal and the way that the cap is going to go up a little bit in 2025 and how that could play into all of that. So I'm going to get into that and how I'm looking at it more after this. But Adam, since you, you know, are more on the blow it up Rockets path, you know, we have a general idea, but to you, what is the optimal version of what that could look like if the Nets and the Rockets are going to the negotiating table? Like, what's the outcome there that you think you would love to see, you know, if you're Brooklyn? Yeah, there, there's definitely there's definitely layers to the path of because I, I think saying blow it up is, first of all, blowing it up to me also suggests that there's something to blow up per se. And I think the sample size after the Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving trades is well, this isn't really a great team. It's not a great product. It's not very well constructed. And we understood that going back to when you end up with all of these players via the superstar trades, these aren't the perfect versions of players you want back in that all complement one another. It's it's why we keep dreaming in just an episode about oh, Ben Simmons. What are they going to do if he comes back and looks mildly healthy? Well, they'd love to have a ball handler because they don't have a lot of those types of players on their team, right? So when I think about Houston, the Houston giving back Brooklyn their control of their picks for Phoenix picks, that's enticing, but not necessarily overwhelming. The 2025 draft is very exciting to think about. I like it better if Houston wants to come calling for Mikhail Bridges and you can get your own pick control back, most of them, if not all of them. And then you still have the Phoenix picks because that to me then represents the best of all worlds. You turn around in 2025, as Doug mentioned, as you're mentioning, Hey, we have flexibility. We have cap room. We can go pursue players in the 2025 offseason, and it can be the start of a different direction around competing now, but probably with two key players involved that you feel like you have sustainable success, maybe a little bit younger or obviously another level of talent, because I, I don't know about for you, Eric, but we look at Mikhail Bridges and it's not a knock on him. You want him to be your third best player at the best. That's where you want to slot him in. Anything more than that is still going to put a lot of pressure on a lot of other players on this roster, including someone like Cam Thomas. So that's where I think that avenue for Houston. Hey, you want Mikhail Bridges? Great. Give me some picks. If I could push for a player, that'd be great. But I also spoke with Jackson Gatlin from Locked on Rockets, and he seems to believe that Houston looks at that young six-player core 
as being borderline untouchable. Now, could you push for it? Maybe. And I think at that point, you're you're debating if you're if you're uh, the Brooklyn Nets, do we want more of our picks back going forward, or maybe a young player that's at least proven something in the NBA? Yeah, I listened to that uh, podcast with the Locked On Rockets guy, and this is the thing with the whole NBA. Like we're talking about, like now I guess we have cores of six. Like we have the core four, the big three. Like we need to come up with some new name for that, but like. The, the core six is untouchable. I mean, like, come on, man. Like, I was we, surprised. I was surprised by labeling six young players, 22 yeah, or like, younger, and going like, we, these are all guys that we believe are going to be a part of the future. As we know in the NBA landscape, like that just never, it very yeah. rarely works out that way where all of those players end up being key contributors going forward. Yeah. Also, like, like with fan bases, fan bases do become irrationally attached to the young players wow. too. Like, it, and, and, like, like I, it's like, a, by the, throw out any trade online mm-hmm. um, where there's a young player and and just wait and just see the the the, the fan bases come in and just explain to you no matter it doesn't matter how that player is played explain that fan base will explain to you how it's like just the most ridiculous thing ever that you would ever want to pry that person loose they can usually end up complaining about that player a lot but the second yeah. you it's like selling your house <laughs> the second you want to trade that player um absolutely forget about it that that's not a rockets fan base thing either that's anybody i mean that's that's fans do it with cam thomas like everyone does it with a young player if you have a young player that's done anything in the basketball court that that guy is now completely yeah. untouchable no matter what the package is you saw it here with you know i'm sure you guys remember with karis lavert and these guys back in the day who oh, yeah. like you know i did really great things with the nets but the way that some nets fans were talking about karis lavert back then i remember it you would have thought that this guy was like unassailably going to be like a top 15 player in the nba and i like karis but like yeah. you know we saw where that went but yeah, so it's like it's funny to me. Like we come to the negotiating table, and the Rockets are gonna be like, "You guys want like Tari Eason? Like, hang up the phone. We're not like we're not entertaining that." But um, right, right. Yeah, and, and even going back to sorry, even going back to the, with the Houston trade and Jared Allen, it's like you can look now and see. Well, now Cleveland's talking about with two years left on his contract. Maybe we're thinking about moving him, rearranging. Why? Because we have Donovan Mitchell, and we're trying to figure that out this off season. So the tier system, right? It's like those players yeah. always fall into those slots, and I think. You see it when you hear the way organizations talk about those players and trying to improve. All of a sudden you go, oh, right, maybe they weren't, you know, the end all be all piece. Yeah. And when, you know, analyzing this Rockets, you know, potential path, you said something that I really agree about. And, you know, I want to preface this by saying that all of it seems like all of these leaks are coming from the Rocket side of things. Mm -hmm. Like we've gotten the reports about, you know, at the deadline, we had the reports they were willing to, you know, offer potentially Jalen Green and several of the Nets picks back for Mikhail Bridges. That was from Jake Fisher first from Yahoo Sports and then Shams Charania uh, confirmed that. And then, you know, we had the Houston Chronicle said the Nets for the Suns picks. And I think we just had Kevin O'Connor during his mock draft say that, you know, he's heard from sources that the Rockets are really interested in Mikhail Bridges and all that. And all of this, you know, from me, because from everybody that I've talked to, you know, people in the Nets organization and people around the Nets organization who are in the know. The only thing that I've ever heard is that we're not fielding offers for Mikhail. We want to move forward with Mikhail. That's been the messaging consistently. So it's not hard for me to deduce that like this is coming from the Houston side and they might be trying to crack the door open with kind of putting out there what we might be willing to offer. But you said something that I really agree with. And when it was that Houston Chronicle report coming out about the Suns pick, versus, you know, swapping with the Nets picks. And a lot of people started getting excited about that. And the first thing that popped into my head is if I'm getting my own picks back and I'm the Nets, I want to send Mikhail Bridges back in that deal. And there's for, you know, a couple of different reasons. The first being the value, the max value of those Nets picks, if I'm trying to get that 2025 pick, especially, which is viewed as like the crown jewel, I want to tank. Like that is the max value of those picks is going into a tank and having that ability. And also, you know, if you trade those, like if we keep Mikhail Bridges, you know, and I, and then I want to tank and I want to trade Mikhail Bridges, like those Suns picks are going to outvalue anything that I'm going to get for Mikhail Bridges on the open market picks wise, in my mm-hmm. opinion. So why would I want to, you know, trade those and then look to get something else? Like that just didn't make any sense to me, but I understand what you're saying also about, you know, this roster, frankly, looked like shit last season. Like it was a really miserable year. So I understand why people are saying, you know, we want to move on from this. But I also said during the year, and I still believe it, that there are players in place here. And I think that this is a really rare, you know, situation where you don't usually have teams that have a lot of veteran high-level role players 
without that star. Like it's a very weird position to be in because usually you get the star and then you surround them with those players. So I have thought that this is a team that, you know, is better equipped if they got a star, it might elevate them more than some other teams. And I think you saw that with a guy like Mikhail Bridges, who like the needle, the pendulum, it's been a roller coaster ride with Mikhail swung so far from the Nets, get him. Oh my God, this guy looks like an all-star. Could this guy be, you know, a bona fide like strong two on a title team to now everybody, like a lot of Nets fans just seem to think that the guy stinks. And I think that he was just blatantly miscast, you know, this past yeah. year. So it was easy. You know, he's a guy, for example, I think that will be elevated a ton if they were to get that star player in here. So I do. Can I say one thing about Bridges too? Like, or just real quick about that, where, where he like, so, because you said something I, that I totally agree with, where it's like, they had the, all the rocket stuff. Just going back to this first point, where it's like all the stuff has come from the rockets. That's that's very obvious, right? The rockets can also float that stuff because they're never really floating players out in the in in these deals. It's always the picks, right? So yeah. it's never going to bruise anyone's ego to have a player mentioned with the deal. So it's much easier for them to float out these ideas around, like the Nets. Even if the Nets were like, "Hey, we're definitely trading Bridges," I think they wouldn't say it. Just yeah. on the on the on the off chance that they might not, right? Because yeah. then you got to have because he's got to eventually walk back in the door, and you don't want it to be you know just a little awkward in the kitchen about when you're like when your paths are crossing, and be like, hey, we wanted to trade you, but like gl so glad to have you back. So I I think that the Rockets are more incentivized to like sort of like leverage pressure around the narrative because they don't really ever have to be like, and it's Jalen Green too. They can just say it's the picks, and they can always just say they want players. And so I trust that the Nets messaging is that they don't want to trade bridges but if also if you just kind of just deduce it on a logical level they would never have it be that any that way anyway until the very moment they actually traded him so i actually don't believe that they're dead set on always never doing it but you'll never hear it because it would be insane to float it yeah. <laughs> right yeah. and, and they're probably under marching orders like hey if you mention this the deal's off Right. Because yeah. I think Marks and company are pretty good about this, where it's, the, yeah. you know, keeping the vault pretty tight, where even if they were engaged on this, the the idea on the first phone call or just the back channel is how these things always work, is that if this gets mentioned, just don't even call back because it's yeah. over and we'll just deny it and the trade's over and we won't do it. So I think that the, the Bridges thing is still probably out there on some level, but you'll just only ever hear it from the other sides. And like that's and I think that's where it comes in with the Rockets. That's just my own take. Like, I don't have that source, but it just seems no. to make sense to me. It's <laughs> it's extremely logical. And, you know, if the Nets, if the Nets were ever going to trade bridges, they're not, you know, and they're not going to budge and like put that out there until the last second of where they're getting hot into these negotiations. So that makes total sense. And I always crack up where you see it on Nets Twitter like a lot. These people who always claim to know that they know, like, you know, where all information is coming one with the Nets, like all oh, the Nets are so leaky, like the Nets are putting out like this, like no. me and other reporters around the team. The Nets are like one of the more one of the most tight lipped organizations in the NBA. Like they don't leak stuff very often, like they keep their information very in house. So, you know, Adam, it sounded like you were going to say something. Go ahead. No, no. And it's also just that you can, you know, organizationally, and we talk about the Rockets, it's the Rockets have all these different paths going forward for themselves. Do they want to compete right now? They can look at the Western Conference landscape. They can think about the young players. They can think about long term term sustainability versus trying to bring in another player that elevates them. And all those paths for them, when they step back goes, and we're still competitive. We're still in the mix. You know, we still think that we're progressing forward, you know, 500 team a year ago, but that was a big step forward for them. From the Brooklyn standpoint, like this is the side of it that I do think is interesting around trading or not trading Mikhail Bridges. There's the one part of it when you get this really small sample size of Noah Clowney at the end of the season and you say, oh, OK, because we watched him early in the year. We watched him in summer league and thought, do not put any pressure on Noah Clowney to have to be a part of this team for at least a season, maybe even two seasons because he needs to develop physically. He looked a little bit you know, out of sorts in, in the small sample size. Then at the end of the year, you get this kind of exciting look at him. And while, again, look at the result of the season last year for the Nets, while trading away Mikhail Bridges and Dorian Finney-Smith and maybe Cam Johnson, you'd go, well, of course the team is going to be really bad. And they, and they would be, but you'd be talking about developing your young talent. So you would then be pivoting to the new direction, which is starkly contrasting. And I think that's to me, feels like what the organization maybe struggles with is 
in theory, drifting into obscurity if you choose to make these trades with players that are known in the league and that are established like Mikhail Bridges versus going into, hey, it's young talent and we'll see what happens. I, I sometimes think they put more pressure or emphasis on that than maybe the fan base or anyone really cares from the outside looking in. Because by and large, I think the Nets are looked at as a non-factor. Like they are a non-factor right now in the NBA landscape. And making those choices between now and the 2025 offseason does seem to be a, a bit of a weight over their head right now. And we just talked about the Ben Simmons piece where maybe you just got lucky by waiting so long that now you're like, well, it's just another year. And then we're all done. And you you didn't have to make a choice. You didn't have to make a hard decision. You just let that happen for you. And that may be kind of what happens here with Mikhail Bridges too over the life of his contract. Yeah. And there's, there's multiple layers here of no team wants to be, you know, in obscurity. Um, and I think especially for the Nets, I think it's fair to say that being in the New York market, just having KD and Kyrie and all of that with how poorly that went, but then the Knicks coming out and just, you know, kind of lighting the world on fire for a large portion of the season, you know, it's not, it, it was far from an optimal situation for the Nets to be in. And you're talking about, you know, pivoting and going into a rebuild and potentially going through two more years of being really bad while the Knicks are just going the complete opposite direction. That's a tough pill to swallow yeah. for uh, Joe Sy. And it's also, you know, I've made this point about Sean Marks for a while. Sean Marks is going into his ninth season as GM. And a lot of people were just completely miffed that he still has the job at this point. So for, this is, I've made this point as a reason why I think the Nets are going to try to stay competitive. For a guy like Sean Marks, who is going into his ninth season as GM, has one series win. And I like a lot of the things Sean Marks has done while he's here. But still having that job and allowing him to now go into a rebuild where you're pretty much saying he's going to be here for another two, three, four years, thats it's pretty unprecedented for that to oh, happen. No, so. Everyone else would have been fired. No other GM would No other GM would have made it this far. Every other GM would have been fired two two iterations ago or another well, at least one iteration ago like it's gone i agree with you i think like marginally and it actually at the time i try we try to always go back and think about what we said at the time and try to evaluate off that because that's just the, the only fair way to do it like re revisionist history around this stuff usually clouds everyone's judgment but i got a landscaper here in the back sorry um the the uh but the the idea that marks is still has a job is kind of like it's completely insane. Honestly, it's gone all bad at the highest levels. It's gone so wrong at every single level, at every single big move. He's been, I think along the margins, great, small moves, pretty good. The, the, the rare times he's drafted seems like it's gone pretty good. The big stuff, F minus every time. KD, F minus Kyrie, F minus like Harden, F minus Simmons. F -minus. Like it's, it's so bad at the highest level. You said no series wins. No other GM would still have this job. They would all yeah. be fired only just for the optics. Even if you like the guy, just the optics would get him fired. Like that, that yeah, would be, that would be it. And, and we that's always what say, I'm, the optics are what I'm mostly talking about because I think yeah. it's very, like, I, I didn't want to get like, we're not going to get into litigating like Marx's whole tenure because that's been done ad nauseum. But I'm just yes. saying like, there's obviously a lot of, like he made a lot of moves that all GMs would have made, you know, at the time there were some, you know, black swan events like the COVID, you know, whatever, like a lot of things have gone wrong. He's made a lot of high-level mistakes along the way. Namely, if I'm analyzing it, the coaches have been a big mistake, in my opinion. Sorry, so I'm I forgot, saying, those, I, forgot those ones too. And by the way, sorry, all quick, the coaches. The grades yeah. were only the grades were only the results, not the moves. Yeah. Like I was re really clear, like the results of those things were the grades, not the yeah. not the things. And sorry, but yeah, the coaches is a great call, which is the other one. It's like you're allowed infinity coaches also. Yeah, well, the, and I think too the, the the one the one notable about that is unlike maybe other other franchises in the NBA, it also seems like Joe Sy and Sean Marks are in lockstep with one another. So like in my mind, there's been times where you would say, boy, that's a, that's a, that's fireable right there. You know, you lost three superstars in the blink of an eye. You probably shouldn't be back here. But because it feels like it's an extension of Joe Sy saying, hey, I want to go all in. And Sean Marks reacts with, okay, we'll go all in. I'm going to make these moves. Hey, this isn't working. We need to, we need to blow it up. Okay, I'm going to blow it up. Like there's some part of that where Sean Marks saving grace may be that Joe Sy wanted to be competitive in this market, wanted to make the big push for stars. And then with everything that went on, he goes, okay, 
I can look past that and think that it's not solely on you. It doesn't mean it's right. doesn't mean he should have been fired, as you say, Eric, just from optics alone. Yeah. But it does feel like it's this collective kind of uh, the hive mentality, right? We're all inside of this thing. It's the Borg, and we're all just moving through this journey. And there's never going to be a time when you look at any one piece from an organizational level and say, oh, sorry, you're the reason that this went awry. And that goes yeah. all the way down to the coaching level as well. Yeah. And, you know, last thing I'm going to say about Marx and, you know, if you if you look at where a lot of things went wrong, you know, the domino event that started the downfall was the pandemic. And you talk about Joe Sy and Sean Marks being in lockstep. If you look at a lot of the events and a lot of the decisions that Kyrie Irving was at the center of that kind of led to the fall because Kyrie Irving's not available. Then James Harden wants out. Then you got Ben Simmons. And, you know, now Kyrie's not happy and he wants out. And then KB's out the door. So all that happens. But if you look at the events and the decisions that kind of played a role in that, you know, Kyrie not getting vaccinated and Kyrie not being able to play in home games. If you look at, you know, how Joe Sy has talked about the pandemic and the vaccine and his things, I don't think it's too hard to deduce that that was a Joe Sy decision or very strongly likely that that was a Joe Sy decision. Mm -hmm. And you look at, you know, the Kyrie posting the anti-Semitic film and all of that and him having, you know, being suspended and having to do these steps and all that. Very safe to say that's a Joe Sy decision, which seemed like, burned a bridge a little bit with Kyrie Irving and the Nets. And then if you're talking about all those decisions that are being made by Joe Sy, and then, you know, it's kind of leading to a greater implosion of some of these things. I think it's kind of hard for Sy to turn around and look at Marks and put all the blame on him for a lot of these things. So a theory of mine that I don't think is too hard to see of how, you know, their relationship and kind of the decision-making and some of that stuff could have played out. But the reason I even brought up Marks was to say that, you know, optically for him to go into a rebuild and be leading that for the foreseeable future, being into his ninth year and with all that going on, it would be unprecedented. Whether you think he's a good GM, bad GM, should have been fired, shouldn't have been fired. It would it would be very, very, it would be pretty crazy. And that's why a big reason why I've thought that the stay competitive route seems like the likely direction they're going to go. And that's where all of the signaling has been, you know, that's where all the signaling has been put by them in, you know, this last year. So I want to get into kind of parsing out what that could look like. And mm -hmm. I said it earlier that I don't have to squint too hard to see how they could be looking at this. Like they could be saying, you know, we have Mikhail Bridges, who's on a great value deal for the next two seasons. So that's, you know, one guy in the door who can be a top three player on a title team. The question then becomes, you know, how do we get the other two? And we have all these draft picks, you know, seven that we can trade, some of which are very highly valued. And then we're going to have a massive chunk of cap space next offseason. So between, you know, the combination of those picks and the cap space, there's a path to acquire star players or, you know, one star in a very good assortment of high level, you know, elite role players. And I said earlier, you know, that $76 billion TV deal. The caps, you know, I did the math and the caps going to jump probably $15 million in that 2025 offseason. And, you know, I just wrote an article about it. But depending on the roster decisions that the Nets make, they could have, you know, they could open up nearly $80 million in cap space, depending on what they do with Dorian Finney-Smith, Cam Thomas and Dayron Sharp. So mm -hmm. they'll have the position, you know, between all those draft picks and all that cap space they can open up. To pursue those players and naturally the question for everyone is you know who are these stars like who are they going to get because we can say we have these picks we have this cap space but you need players and you know we saw a similar path this is what the nets did in 2019 of they cleared a ton of cap space they signed kb and Kyrie, and then they have all their future picks to trade for a guy like james harden but i think it's pretty safe to say that the nets had great intel a year prior to that that katie and Kyrie were in, very interested in coming here do they have that kind of intel now? You know, that's the question, but no information has been reported to indicate yes. So the plan right now more seems like we're going to be able to pitch these guys on the assets, the vision we have, and get a little boost from the New York market. And, you know, Sean Marks even gave a quote that pretty much said exactly that when he fired Jock Vaughn and they were he was asked about, is this a move aimed at attracting stars? And he said, we have to show stars there's a pathway to win here. I think there's a very clear pathway from draft assets, cap room, and everything else we've got. And I think the city speaks for itself. It's very clear that people have wanted to come here and play in the past. So that, that's that's pretty much it right there. Adam, go ahead. Looks yeah, like I, I mean, it's, it, it, 
that's great. It's great. You know, New York market is so attractive. We're, we're such a great city and, you know, clearly it speaks for ourselves and I'm, awesome. But I, I, we've done this before to your first, to your first point. Okay. Name the guys, name the players that clearly are ready to kind of move on from their current situations over the last five years. And by the way, you can look across town to the New York Knicks. They spent years talking about LeBron James, Giannis, just you wait, 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 wait. And then finally, at one point they said, we can't keep dreaming on this. We just need to start constructing our roster. Wait for maybe a really opportunistic player to come up like Jalen Brunson that the Dallas Mavericks inexplicably decide, ah, we don't really want to pay him a reasonable deal. And then all of a sudden it helps launch you. But they built it up the right way. When you get to the 2025 offseason, okay, there's not going to be a lot of teams that have the amount of financial flexibility that the Nets do. But there will be other teams. And... It, it has to come down to that that key point that everyone seemed to point to when you first got Mikhail. Everybody would love to play with Mikhail Bridges. He's well respected, well regarded around the league. Okay, but I've seen time and time again when superstars. It's just like when Kyrie and Kevin Durant came to Brooklyn. I want to play with another superstar. I don't want to play with a with an elite role player with an elite number three. If we get that second guy, and if you're the Brooklyn Nets and you go and pursue I, I, the name player X Y Z, say Donovan Mitchell doesn't re up and he is just available on the market next summer. Fine, you go get him. We said this before. Name the next player because that's that's only step one. Step one of getting Donovan Mitchell makes you a playoff team. It does not make you a top half of the Eastern Conference team. So now you have to yeah. go get that other player. And what if you miss? Or what if you go the route of spending all those Phoenix picks to acquire that next player? Now, you can make very strong cases. Hey, who cares? Let's be competitive. Let's go for it. We'll live with it when the dust settles. The other side of that is you go all in, you deplete all your assets, you don't have your own pick control until 2095, and you sit there and say a 28, 29-year-old Donovan Mitchell to 30-year-old, you know, like things start to, to start to deteriorate very quickly, including Mikhail Bridges being Mr. Iron Man until he's not Mr. Iron Man. And then all of a sudden you lose a piece there. I, it's a very, it is a very grim view, I think, to take. And normally I'm pretty optimistic around what the team can do and how quickly they can turn things around. But putting all of your eggs into, we'll have all this money and we'll just get the stars. I think that's a very dangerous premise, knowing that other teams are in there. It's not just, hi, so good to meet you. Here's all the money. Come play for us. It, it's going to take more than that. And I, I have a hard time envisioning the two players that are available next off season that make that work. And like, it's also, it's, if you just look at team construction around the NBA, especially around the good teams right now, like let's just take the teams that have made it all the way to the finals or the Western conference final, like, or East or the team, the conference finals, you, you kind of do have to, at some point, you have to like, at some point start with the draft. Like at some point you have to draft a good player. I got, I, sorry. I, I just like, you, like are bad for just, you know, pointing this out. You have to, at some point, get into the draft and just draft someone who's a top 15 player. Nets don't ever seem to want to do it. It's fine. Whatever. They've gotten these guys in the past this way. And maybe you can convince yourself they're always going to be available that way because um, your confirmation bias has just led you down this path. Like they've gotten a lot of these guys by not drafting them. So maybe we can just keep doing it. That just gets harder and harder every single year. These guys sign extensions way earlier. They take all the money up front. It, they should. Katie and Kyrie were just sort of like in the same way, you know, black swan events happened to work against them. Those guys coming up in free agency was just equally un <laughs> unprecedented, yeah. right? That like that kind of never happens. So I just think at some point, if you just look at all these teams and say, hey, how would they get their best players? Hey, they drafted them and then they built everything else around and they have them on, on cost controlled or eventually, you know, big contracts. But it's just such a financial boon to have a really great player not making all the money, to have their bird rights, to have all this stuff early on, to be able to offer them early extensions. You just have to do that at some point. And just show me the team that's built long term that didn't do that. Like, there aren't any. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't think. I, it's, like, it's the, the Lakers, the Lakers, and they got the, the best player that's ever played. Okay. So, you know, you want to get one, you want to get LeBron James when he's still kind of near his prime. Okay, great. Maybe yeah. it was going to work out for you. Then so that's that's the part where it always falls down for me. And I get so I don't have any hair left, as was pointed out to me before we started recording. But the <laughs> the um the part where the fan comes in and says, you know, oh, it might not work. Uh, no crap. <laughs> like like no crap. No, we say that about anything. It, it might not work. Yeah, we get it. It might not work. But if you look if you look at just like probabilistically around what method seems to be working in the NBA right now. It's take a bunch of stabs at the draft and hope you land the top 10 or top 15 guy. 
because otherwise you're conti- you're just paying you're paying 150 cents on the dollar to go grab the guy from someone else later and it just doesn't make sense and it's hard and it, and I, I get why the nets are sort of like an existential risk territory here but at just some point you have to bite the bullet and just do the way that seems like it works for all the other teams and like i said that's the whole you know, questions surrounding the state competitive path in 2025 and all that is who are these guys? Like that's the crux of the issue because they're, you know, when looking at who could be available that, you know, this off season, Donovan Mitchell has been the guy that everybody's talked about. He could become available. He could not. I like, you know, thought that the Nets have had their eye on him for a long time. And I've heard that from people around the league. And I don't think that that's, you know, that's not like they've been linked to him for a while now. So I, I literally did a podcast. My last podcast was with, uh, Scotto called are the Nets all in on Donovan Mitchell on a trade for him because you know like outside of him like if they strike out on him it's like who are these guys like who's coming here to do this and you know guys who are set to be free agents in 2025 I have the list right in front of me you're talking stars you know it's Mitchell uh, Jason Tatum Jalen Brunson Laurie Markkinen Jimmy Butler Paul George Jamal Murray Kyrie Irving Brandon Ingram Alper and Shengun are the big names if I was going to set the over under on how many of those guys are actually going to hit for agency at like, say 1.5, yeah. I'd, right. I'd probably take the under because yep. it doesn't seem like if you, if you look at those guys, like guys are just extending teams don't want to lose control. And if they're not extending, they're going to trade them. Like we're seeing with Mitchell right now, if he doesn't want to extend. So that, you know, I understand where people are coming from of who are these guys who are going to be available. You know, I understand what Doug, what you're saying with, eventually you got to draft a guy and you got to build sustainable success. Cause if you're looking at the nets right now, even if they are to pull this off somehow, a lot of these guys are getting up and into their thirties. So we're not talking about, you know, we're not talking about a 10 year window that they're going to be opening up probably like, that's not how this is going to go. And, you know, that's why it gets interesting with some of those comments that Joe Sy made. We heard at you know, the uh, billionaire convention summit or whatever that was at, but You know, I think there also is a vision like there is a reality where this could work out, you know, and I I don't think that it's it's not crazy far fetched to say that they could pull something like this off. Because, like, Adam, you were talking about, like, they're more than one move away. Like if you're the Nets and you're able to pull off a move for whoever or you're able to, you know, get that one guy that comes out, you know, in free agency, you are putting together, you know, like a vision. You do have things and assets a guy like Mikhail Bridges, you have that other star, you have either cap space or draft picks left over, and you do have a pitch to a guy mm-hmm. who might say, you know, like if you're going to those next guys after you pull off that first move, you can pitch them, hey, look, like we got Bridges, we have this guy, we either have, you know, these Phoenix picks or we have our cap space left over to fill out the rest of the roster. And I said, and that's can open you know, 70 to $80 million in cap space. Like it's not insignificant because if you're looking at also, I have a list here of high level role players who were set to hit free agency in 2025. Uh, Derek White, Rudy Gobert, Aaron Gordon, Miles Turner, Nas Reed, Jonathan Isaac, Julius Randle, D'Angelo Russell. Like there are guys that are going to hit free agency, whether they're stars or role players. But that's the point I made at the top about the Nets having these assets, whether it be, you know, all that, that massive chunk of cap space that they can open up and these draft picks, they're going to have both of those things. So whichever one they use, they can use that, you know, they can use the other plus the guys that they Mm -hmm. already have in the door, Bridges and Mystery Name, to pitch that new guy of, look, we have a real path here to building this out, and we're in the New York market, and it seems like that's kind of the encompassing way that they're trying to go about this. Adam, go ahead. And I know I I think you you can go that route. It's funny you talk about the key high level free agents. You talk about some of the key high role players. What 85 percent of them or thirty plus, right? So you're talking about a version of this team where they go all in to try to make this happen with a group of guys that are all going to be thirty and thirty one and thirty two years old. Now again, it's a better product than what they are currently putting out there. So there's there's no denying that that side of it and what it can mean from being competitive and being the playoffs and selling tickets. I mean, let's, let's not, you know, bury the lead here. Making money is kind of a key component of having, you know, having one of these franchises and not being the playoffs hurts that the, the interesting thing is though, it's like we saw it give up a first round pick to get Royce O'Neal because he's a good support player for the Kevin Durant era. Okay. Well that, that kind of fell apart. Okay. We'll, we'll get rid of him a a year late. Same thing now with Dorian Finney Smith, you have him, but he's not really going to be a part of the future going forward. Even if it is, going and getting these players in the 2025 offseason. So we'll move off of him. 
Cam Johnson to me is just an absolute red flag waiting to be lifted up in terms of his health. He's never heavily injured, but he's always kind of injured. So now there's a reliability there as he gets a little bit older. So I actually think, I mean, maybe to do the, I'll do the, the fun picture going forward, going and getting these players, spending money and bringing in talent. And then the back end of that can end up actually looking like still looking at Mikhail Bridges and saying, is he valuable to another team? Do we recoup some of the assets that we spent? So there's kind of this carousel nature to it where depending on what side of it you're standing on, you see a very viable, but very different looking path over the next three to four years for the Brooklyn Nets. And some of them are different levels of success in terms of, you know, on the court, but they're all viable. I, I think that's, that is a reality. The three of us could sit here and give three variations of what they do over the next two to three seasons and off seasons and both and all come out saying, yeah, and I, I can like that. I can see the path forward and being happy with it. Some of them are just a little more dangerous in terms of what you need to do relative to what the rest of the league is going to be trying to accomplish. Where's the next competitive team that wants Donovan Mitchell and that he wants to go play with, right? What's the next competitive team that makes the play for Giannis when he becomes available and is more attractive than the Brooklyn Nets? So all those things become a factor. And that's where I think Doug and I often come back to controlling your own destiny, controlling your own picks, your own assets always makes it easier, right, wrong, and different to choose your path and know that you can control it. Yeah. And, you know, you just pointed out the risk and all that involved. And that's kind of where this conversation was going, what I want to talk about now, because, you know, there is a risk involved. You know, you wait until the 2020, 2025 offseason, which seems like they, you know, it's what they want to do. You see what is what. And if you strike it out at that point, you pivot and you trade bridges. Now, many Nets fans have been right to point out the risk of, you know, you've waited until 2025, you've held bridges. Now he has one year left on this deal that everybody has said is so amazing, one of the best in the NBA. You've also held on to guys like Cam Johnson and Dorian Finney-Smith much longer to where their value has taken a hit. The question becomes, is the risk, um, is that risk worth the potential reward of landing stars with these assets? And, you know, I'm not sure, but I think it's a much, you know, closer conversation than a lot of, a lot of people have wanted to admit. And I do think that, you know, there's a real question of, you know, is it worth it to wait that long and to see what is what? Because there is a very real world where you can come away with one of those marquee names. Now, the real risk is, you know, centered around the Houston Rockets because the value of, you know, this this other path of the rebuild to me is squarely centered around getting your picks back and being able to reset, having control. And the longer you wait, you wait until 2025, we're just saying like, a lot of Nets fans are telling themselves the story that Raphael Stone's just sitting at his table, just like twiddling his thumbs, waiting for the Nets to come calling for the next year or so. That is the risk involved. And, you know, whether which side of the fence you land on, you know, whatever. But I do think that a lot of Nets fans have seemed to say, like, you have to blow it up. You have to rebuild. Like, that's not or you have to like, you know, you got to go for these stars. You got to do that. Like, there is a very viable route, as you said, into both directions. And it seems like the conversation hasn't always, you know, a lot of people haven't wanted to admit that. If the if the 2025 pick wasn't on the table from the Rockets, then I would it would make sense that the, the Nets would never consider it, right? And the Nets really did themselves so dirty this year by stinking because now the Rockets can look at that and say, <laughs> I mean, how much better are you going to be this year, right? Yeah. And like to that, that 2025 pick holds, I mean – probably not as much value as it would have if the Nets controlled it themselves because they'd be able to just for sure just lose every game imaginable. But like the Rockets, I mean, the Rockets just spiked the, lose, right? Yeah, the Rockets <laughs> just spiked the third spot. pick. <laughs> they just spiked the third pick and the Nets were trying. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it was like, so you don't have to really you don't have to squint too hard if you're the Rockets to see it. So I actually wouldn't be surprised if these things came up. And th those picks were just never, even four bridges were never on the table because they would just stare at them and just say, hey, we'll just do a little game of chicken here. Go try your best. You just, you were tryhards last year and it didn't work out. So, you you know, you still got Simmons. You, you still got all these guys, that, like, all this bad money. Uh, go for it. Um, and so I agree. I would not do it unless those picks were back on the table. And also, like, sometimes we look at, like, the risk involved. You know, we say risk as the risk involved is, you know, that you don't be able to recoup full value. Also, there's the 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 flip side of that or the counter argument is there's risk involved 
to not be able to grab one of these like high level superstars that came available because you already chose your path early. Like that is a, that's also a risk, right? Like that's also, cause I was thinking about like, there's also like this next group of possibly unhappy guys that we just don't talk about yet. Right. Right now it's like, it's the Giannis's and the Embiid's and like these guys who are getting older who might be unhappy. I don't know. Then you got like the John Morant's and the Zion's and these guys that are might be on the the next up on the clock of being unhappy. So you just never, and that could be part of the evaluation too. It's like, yeah, someone's I, always unhappy so I want to say, we just yeah. gotta wait that's we just gotta wait to the name that's What's the that? line there's somebody someone's always unhappy in this this era of nba player empowerment and movement i yeah. i just don't think it's so crazy for the nets to say hey one of these good guys might become unhappy and they might look at you know new york and, and our assets and guys that we may have already been able to sign with cap space or trade for at that point and say hey like i want to go play there like it's not it's not insane to the point where you know some nets fans have wanted to make it and we're talking about who those guys could be like i don't want to get too much into it but i just wrote an article and i mean like you're talking about you're looking at situations around the nba i think there's a very real world where Giannis might be a guy who you look at the bucks situation like i'm not saying the nets are going to get him but just like looking at the situation that the Bucks are in. They just traded, I mean, Giannis probably wanted them to, so that's a different conversation, but they just traded Drew Holiday, Grayson Allen. They're, you know, a future first round pick. They're two remaining future first round pick swaps. It backfired. You know, Damian took a major step back. Their defense went from fourth to 19th. The Celtics, their main rival in the East, end up getting Holiday and are look like they're about to cruise to a championship. Like that's that's not great. And then you look at what they have. They have Middleton, who's about to be uh, 33. They got Lopez, who's about to be 37. They have, you know, one pick and one first round pick in this year's draft, which everyone's saying stink. And their 2031 pick to trade. They have no young players to include in a trade like that. Like their best ones, you could say young, are Bobby Portis and Pat Connaughton. Like they don't have a great future there. Like that's 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 like a situation where you could look at it and you can tell yourself a story of hey. We get to the 2025 offseason. The Bucs might have had an early playoff exit for the third year in a row. Mm -hmm. Like Giannis could be looking around saying, like, what is what? So that's like that's the situation and like situations like that. It's not crazy for the Nets in this era of player empowerment where these players want, you know, are pretty spoiled and want like everything they want now. It's not crazy to think that a guy could be asking out. But the next step that I wanted to take this conversation is this 2025 plan, a reason that I you know, I was talking on my podcast with Scotto and saying why it's kind of a difficult sell for me from the Nets to the fan base is the Nets stunk last year. And nobody knows better how miserable the season was than people like you guys and me <laughs> who are trying to make content on a daily basis surrounding this team. Like if I have like, you know, you guys just did a Ben Simmons podcast, like God bless you guys, because I can't talk about like that's I'm just I can't talk about that, that stuff anymore. But you no. Know, <laughs> So that's why I did the whole podcast, All are the Nets all in on the Donovan Mitchell trade? Because let's say they strike out on a Mitchell trade this summer. He stays with Cleveland. We're running it back this year with pretty much the same roster because, you know, outside of Mitchell, it doesn't seem like there's a big name like that's going to be available. The Nets only have the $13 million um, non-taxpayer mid-level exception to use in free agency. Like the roster could look, you know, predominantly the same. And then you're talking about, Going through another miserable year, you got to sell that on the fan base just in hopes of landing this mystery star in 2025. The Rockets also have your pick, which could be really good in a whole draft. I thought that was, you know, that's a very, it's a tough sell to the fan base. So the question that it brought me to is if they go that route, are they making a bridge move, say, to improve next season? And if so, who could that guy be? And it's funny because Bill Simmons and Ryan Rosillo actually just did a podcast and they were talking about some of these guys. I saw you tweet about it. So I just want to throw out some of these names and kind of parse out quickly if it could be viable, you know, for the Nets to trade for a guy who maybe could help them in the long term and also could help them stay competitive this uh, coming season as they wait for 2025. The first guy was Trey Young and Bill Simmons proposed a trade. He said, Ben Simmons and all the Phoenix picks for Trey Young, which was 25, 25, 2027, 20, 2029, and the 2028 20, swap. And when he finished the word swap, I had to swallow the throw up that came up in my mouth because that just like <laughs> Rusillo shut it down quickly. But like, I was like, Bill, like that, that is just an abomination of a trade. But just talking about Trey Young, talking about like, 
you know, does that pique your guys' interest at all? Because, you know, just for me, I'm not very interested in getting into the Trey Young market just based on the player and what the price is going to be, as is evident by the fake trade that Simmons threw out. Yeah, you want to throw out that. If, if that's the fake trade that the Brooklyn Nets have to make to get Trey Young, then I I fake vomit as, <laughs> right along with you, Eric. I mean, that's just nuts, right? And we, we talked about getting off the Ben Simmons money a little bit sooner, but he's in the final year. So it's not like we're talking about, oh, you saved us next season and yeah, having that, that move, money on the books and stuff. In addition to in addition to get rid of, getting rid of your Phoenix picks, that move also eliminates your cap space. So it could be like one of the yeah, worst it, trades the Nets could possibly make. Yeah. So now, yeah, you have no, you don't have your own draft pick control. You don't have the Phoenix picks anymore. And and Trey Young is just he's not the guy that you spend all those picks on to go get to put yourself in a spot where you're both paying him and then talking about who's the player we bring in. Well, if it's not directly in free agency in 2025, it's via trade. But wait, we lost all of our picks trading for Trey Young. So, I mean, I won't even go too far into the weeds on him. That Yeah, that'd be he is not of that caliber of player in terms of making a all in sort of move that I would ever go near for the Brooklyn Nets. Yeah, I, mean, I think like for us too. like I, I heard I listened to that podcast and like sometimes, you know, it's, it's funny in the content world because like I listened to that podcast and I thought. Let's just do the Ben Simmons podcast instead, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because <laughs> because the Trey Young thing, I get why Simmons did it. I, I or sorry, I get why Bill Simmons says it, but I think he's shown like too, like I, not to just go too negative there, but he has shown. He doesn't really have a pulse. I think on like sort of like what's happening. I think he's a good. His, he's good on a historical level, and I think that like sometimes when it gets down to the nitty gritty like that, it's just kind of like I don't know that that just might be making it up, you know, while he's laying around. I do worry a little bit that they'll make a move not similar to that, but like of like the Brandon Ingram Ooh. ilk. I don't think it's going to be like that, but it's yeah. like I, I'm only throwing him to say these marginal guys that might come available that they might be able to convince themselves of in the yeah. short term because they read the tea leaves that the other, the other things aren't going to work out here, especially if they re-sign Claxton and that might get a little expensive and they might yeah. see their cap space isn't as clean as they thought it was going to be because that market went up a little higher. Like, I think there's some domino effects that could happen here. And I'm not saying Ingram. I'm only using Ingram as an example of this, like, top 50 guy well, who I, people I might think some, is better. I have some other names. Ingram, I actually didn't put as one of them because I just don't think, like, I just don't think he's a fit with the Nets. I think he's going to cost too much money, and I don't sure. think it makes sense. But we gotta be another more concise, guy. Doug. we got to be more concise on these on the, on the names that Eric's uh, bringing up. <laughs> um Another guy is, you know, the Hawks are pretty widely expected within NBA circles to split up their backcourt. And the other guy is DeJounte Murray. And I I literally wrote an article, you know, after news came out that I think it was Mark Stein reported it, that they're going to like most likely split up this backcourt. I wrote an article pretty much saying like I'm not really enthused by either of them, but like I definitely wouldn't go near Trey Young just based off of what the price is going to be for him. Murray is the guy the Nets were linked to at the deadline. And I do think there's a little bit more interesting of a conversation because, you know, he's going to cost so much less. Like you could potentially get him with giving up like, you know, two maybe say of your like non Phoenix picks, like non high leverage picks. But at the same time, he's also not viewed as the same caliber of player, you know, as young is. So you, does that pique your guys' interest at all? Being able to get him giving up like two non-high value picks. Well, I, I want to add. I want to hear Adam, Adam and I haven't really talked too much about Dejounte Murray, and I'll let him respond to the, about the Murray piece. I will say one thing really quickly: is that the Nets realized last year that possibly the worst than being bad is being boring. Like, mm -hmm. and that's what the Nets were last year. And I think that could influence some of the decisions this last year because it was like you can be bad as long as there's a future, but when you're boring. It's the worst, and uh, yeah. so if they're in like the don't be boring mode, that's where you could see guys like Murray. But I like that's I just want to interject that real quick before we get to yeah. Murray, who probably is more interesting than Trey. And yeah, so I mean to that point, right? You want to be a little more interesting, a little more entertaining. Murray is is a viable option. The funny thing about him is, if you look at his contract out to twenty seven, twenty eight, making thirty one million dollars, he would almost I think fall into the category along with the Mikhail Bridges, where you go, oh, the contract, you know, this is a good contract. You're getting value on it, and he's probably still tradable too over the yeah, back end of that contract point. as well. Yeah, so if, if you talk about, depending on price point, right, when it comes to the Phoenix picks and the non-high leverage ones, maybe you try to float the Dallas first round pick instead because you don't want to touch those Phoenix ones at all. Okay, that you can paint a picture where bringing him in obviously makes the team a little bit better, doesn't 
you know, blast your ceiling to some different stratosphere, making the play in tournament would be a nice adjustment or the, you know, the playoffs first round team. I don't know if that accomplishes it, but at least makes you more entertaining is to Doug's point, like night in night out. This is a guy that can be electric that can really excite the fan base in a way that Mikhail Bridges, not knocking him just is not going to do more in the vein of a cam Thomas, right. Can turn it on one night and go off for 40 plus and really make for, if not a good team, at least an entertaining team. And there's probably a price point where that makes sense for Brooklyn over the short term. And I think the tradability of, of Murray maybe over those last two years of the contract would be enticing for Brooklyn from that standpoint too, because it would fall right in line with maybe you extend yeah. bridges and you still trade them. Maybe it's Johnson, you know, all these players, you'd be in the same ilk of being able to reset things pretty quickly. Yeah, that everything you just said kind of summarizes my viewpoint on it. And I'm like, I'm not the biggest DeJounte Murray guy, but if the Nets are trying to, you know, stay competitive while maintaining like maximum flexibility while accomplishing both those things at the same time, like he's a guy that makes sense, you know. And it, it, it I have to note that at the deadline, the, um, the Hawks were reportedly asking for two first round picks. It's a price the Nets didn't want to pay. So if he's available, like, it could still be two first round picks if they're able to get him for say like you know the 2025 Phoenix and the 2027 Philly or the Dallas like though the non Phoenix picks like there's a world where that makes sense because it helps them stay competitive next year and then when you're field when you're crafting offers maybe in 2025 for a bigger guy or da- even further down the line like he's a flippable contract so it makes sense from that perspective the last guy that I wanted to talk about that um bill simmons also floated and the guy that i actually like kind of got the most excited about was darius garland who i think could make the most sense you know if donovan mitchell was not to uh was to extend with cleveland and isn't on the table you guys i think you guys tweeted it the package was um what was the package you guys tweeted it do you remember it it was uh it was schroeder cam johnson and i think one of the phoenix one of the picks yeah one of the Phoenix picks or both of them? I think it might have been both. Uh, maybe was it, it was both. I think it was we may, we may, And we may have caveated with like, you know, some combination of, right? And if you get yeah. pushed to that extra I, pick. I, yeah. I think the trade that Simmons proposed was Schroeder. Uh, yeah, it was both. Johnson, yeah, Schroeder, I just looked at yeah. it. It was both. Yeah, my bad. 2027 yeah. and 2029 Phoenix picks. And as soon as I saw the Phoenix picks, I was like, that's a no-go. Like the Nets aren't going to do that. So that, was, that wouldn't be on the table. But – I did start to think about it and I did start to parse out how it could work if say they could get him with the non Phoenix picks, which is, or just the 2025, like they have the 2025 Phoenix pick. They have the 2029 Dallas, they have the 2027 Philly. Like if they could get him with two of those picks, I do think there's a world where it could be kind of interesting and I'll like lay out the the vision for you because say they're able to pull that trade off and it's Cam Johnson, uh, Dennis Schroeder, and say, you know, two of those non-Phoenix picks. They have they have Garland and Bridges. Those are their two guys. And then you look at the rest of the roster. They have Clowney, uh, Claxton, Wilson, and Whitehead, definitely. And then they have Cam Thomas and De'Ron Sharp, depending on contract decisions. I'm, assu- I'm assuming they're going to move off Dorian Finney-Smith, probably for an expiring contract. That's what I would think. But if they are to pull that Garland trade off, you now have Garland and Bridges. You have those guys. You have all of your Phoenix picks, and they can have – 40 to $60 million in cap space, depending on what they decide with Thomas and Sharp's contracts. So, you know, if you're going into that 2025 off season and you're looking at that guy who, you know, we just said maybe come disgruntled or available via trade, having Bridges and Garland, having guys like Clowney, you know, Claxton, maybe Thomas and Sharp, depending on that and having a chunk that is like a max cap space slot to either go after a star becomes available or, multiple high-level role players, whether it be a Derek Rupp, White, Nas Reed, whoever could hit the market. Like that is like, that's, that's kind of enticing. Like it got my juices flowing a little bit of like, that makes sense as a path that could keep them competitive in 2025. And also could make some sense long-term. Now Darius Garland, undersized guard, had a bad year last year, broke his jaw, is about to make a lot of money. But my interest in it is mostly stemmed in the fact that I think that Garland is a little bit going to be a little bit undervalued his market value based on a season he just had where he went through like a pretty serious injury and it was kind of a dysfunctional season. 
your guys. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Doug go a little bit deeper on on Garland, but at a high level, I, I think if if the conversation started to go to Cleveland and about Garland, I would almost and again, we're not talking about now being maybe short term competitive. I'd be more talking about oh, so Mikhail Bridges to Cleveland to play with Donovan Mitchell. What else do we get back in return? And because of Garland's age, twenty four years old, you can look at that and say. We continue to get younger. We continue to think about what it looks like going forward. He will be expensive, but he's cost controlled going forward. You know, you have him on the books and you can still think about it. And, and maybe you're starting to examine how attractive is he as one of those players that you still go to 2025 and try to make those moves for another star. Yeah. And, and they, before, Doug, before you go also, one thing yeah. I didn't say is if they are to pull off a move like that for Garland and say they keep Mitchell it also, and uh, keep Bridges, it also opens the door of say we get to 2025, we strike out all that. Now we can trade bridges for whatever we want. And we have a guy in Darius Garland yeah. who's younger and could be a bridge into that new rebuild. So it makes yeah. sense on multiple layers from that. But Doug, go ahead. And people for sure got too wrapped up into like Garland struggled in the playoffs and like the, the fit with Mitchell wasn't super clean. And he was dealing with all these like weird injuries. He's so young. He's been an all-star. The contract looks a little expensive if you just base it on the playoff performance. But if you kind of just kind of dial it back one season that doesn't look too bad it resets your timeline to be a little bit younger like it gives you a little bit more flexibility i almost for sure that contract will look fine after this new deal like i don't think that like that's going to be too too crazy so i think that and also just real real quick on the phoenix picks i know every nets fan wants to look at these phoenix picks as like the i mean the absolute pot at the end of the rainbow the holy which is just overfilling with gold there is a world where those picks have never had more value than they do right now around the narrative around Phoenix. I, yeah. I get that like it doesn't look great. As we've seen in the NBA, things can change pretty quickly. Like it wouldn't take much probably for them to just be okay right in the future. Not great, not great, not winning the championship, but not if the Nets fans have a two have a two front of mind where it's like you trade a pick and it becomes the other team's best thing ever, a la like Jason Tatum and J Jalen Brown, and now a Rockets third pick, which isn't usually, usually that only works if the Nets are sending it. Out. If the, the Nets, Nets are the edge case here, it, it actually only happens with the Nets. Like, <laughs> like, like it doesn't happen for, with any other team. Gerald Wallace for Damian Lillard, like that didn't. Go yeah, right. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Lillard, Lillard too. So it's like. Yeah, it's happened a few times. It's only ever with the Nets picks. All the other teams that trade away these picks, they just end up being middle of the first round, end of the first round. The teams end up kind of figuring it out, and they're just kind of okay. So there is a world where these Phoenix picks right now, based on just the narrative, this is actually the time to cash in on them uh, yeah. with with just uh, with some stuff because it wouldn't take much. Like flip KD for a younger player or two younger players and then you play him with Booker, like that team's going to be good. That team's good for five years. Right. And so I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I get a little worried that Nets fans have looked at these Phoenix picks and said, don't touch them because they'll be, they're going to both be number one overall picks. Like I think it's very, very unlikely for that to happen. And just one quick thing on the, on the potential of like a Garland trade, which I think is interesting. We talk about the paths forward for Brooklyn. If you think about like Brooklyn is walking down and they're about to come to a three prong fork in the road. If you made a trade for a guy like Garland, or if you stood pat this off season, you mentioned the, the Mikhail Bridges contract earlier. The deadline of this upcoming season could actually be a little more active for Brooklyn if it looks like a strikingly similar season to a year ago. Mm -hmm. To your point, the sell high on any of these assets, players or otherwise, the sell high mark might be when you still get the half season plus the next season of control of a player on a good contract. So I, I, that's where I wonder if the Nets want to be competitive. Well, that's why you go make this move for Garland or any player like that, maybe second tier or otherwise. But if you stand pat and go in with some, this mix of young players and the current veterans, maybe excluding Dorian Finney-Smith, who we all feel like is going to be moved, what are we going to be talking about when we get to the deadline? We're going to be talking about a team that's probably not in the playoff picture, that's still waiting to run out the clock on Ben Simmons' contract. You know for a fact teams are going to call about Mikhail Bridges. It'll just come down to whether or not they answer those. And it all comes back to, it's like, w w which direction do you want to go here? And I, I do agree with you, Eric, you said multiple times, there are just versions of this where you make decisions and it still doesn't really alter what you do a season from now and off season from now. So you can still try to play in those improvement waters without damaging the long-term perspective. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty much where all my interest in the potential Garland trade. And I also like, I should point out the fact that Garland's, you know, representatives, I think it's clutch, like Shams Trania literally wrote when the Mitchell stuff was being reported that if Mitchell is to sign an extension with Cleveland, that Garland's camp would seek a trade because and I think it's logical for Cleveland to move off of him because, you know, 
it doesn't really like it hasn't worked out there. And then you also like the Allen and Mobley front court. Like those are two things that seem like they're going to be split up. There's a very real world. Like I think some a lot of people think it's more likely than not that Mitchell's extending right now. And in that case, Garland is a guy who probably will be on the move. So there's a real possibility where he's available. One one note about this too is if he is on the move and if, if Cleveland is retaining Donovan Mitchell, then you have to look at some of the guys we talk about, the names we throw out, the Brendan Ingrams of the world, and looking at some of those teams as being more viable partners for Cleveland because yeah. they're getting a player back. Unless Brooklyn is, that's why I come back to, unless you're open to trading some of these guys, if they look at certain players as valuable, great. But if it's that we can offer you a couple of high value picks, I think Cleveland's going to go somewhere else because, again, they're trying to compete with Donovan Mitchell, not just get future assets to rebuild down the road. Yeah, and, and that's that's the vision. Like I say, like, oh, I'm only interested in this if we can do Dennis Schroeder, Cam Johnson, and a couple right, of the non-premium right. picks. Well, it's like, all right, <laughs> right, like right, right. hang up the phone. Like, we'll go to we'll go to San Antonio or we'll go to New Orleans or whatever. So, yeah, that, you know, I, I was just pointing out that that's a viable route. Like, mm-hmm. it could get into negotiations of, like, we'll give you one of these Phoenix picks. We'll give you one of these non-things. Like, maybe, like, maybe they want Cam Thomas thrown in. Like, whatever. Like, maybe mm-hmm. they want Clown, which, like, then – it gets into a conversation of what becomes too much. I'm just saying like there's a framework where that gives them flexibility moving forward. Like it helps them stay competitive next season. It could help them land that big fish down the line. It could allow them to trade bridges and pivot into the long term. There's a lot of windows that are open there. And I think a lot of people would also say, hey, like Trey Young's a better player than Darius Garland to this point. I think that's pretty much indisputable, but it's the price point for me of I think Garland's price point after last season is going to be much lower than Trey Young's is. And also, like, Garland, I think he's going to be making less money also. And he just went through a season where, like, he broke his draw. He was he was drinking out of a straw for, like, a couple months. Like, he, he, had a, he had a rough season, and I don't think that's indicative of where he's going to be at long term. So I think it's viable from that perspective. Yeah. I think that, too, like, fans tend to – overweight recent performance more than front offices do like i think that the reason you are in front offices on an analytical level is that you are not probably swayed too much by the you know the 37 minutes you saw someone on tnt during the last playoff game right and so i think sorry to cut you off but like that's evident in bridges like all every team in the nba still wants mikhail bridges all the nets fans are like of course every stinks like whatever like but every well, team, my guess, is that every team understands that that was a contextual issue and not a Bridges yeah. issue, right? Like, it was context more than it was, oh, Bridges got so much worse. Like, no one really believes that. In in fans' eyes, he got worse because he underperformed expectations. We've said this, I mean, countless times on the podcast, which is success is expectations, like, divided by results or which, what, whichever way you want to go. It's like, that's the whole, that's, and, and Simmons, or sorry, uh, Bridges underperformed based on his you know, running hotter than the sun from the field effort that were right when he came over from, from the suns, but no one team would look at that contract and be like, yes, they would pay a lot to have him right now because they all kind of get it. The reason you have, you are in front offices because you mostly have a steady hand around this and you have an analytical approach. So I, 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 that's, that's the part where it's like with Garland too. It's like, I don't know, do this trade a year ago. He's one year older and he had a lot of weird stuff happen this year. You do this trade a year ago. I mean, these, these deals would never even get floated because people would think they were crazy. Right. Yeah, and I think that's people, how most, that's how most front offices probably see things. Yeah. There were people last year who were saying that if um, Cleveland's going to trade one of these guys, it should be Mitchell and they should keep yeah. Garland like that. There were people right. who were legitimately saying that. So I do think, you know, just to like summarize this whole conversation that we just had with these three guys, you know, Trey, uh, Murray, Garland, like if the Nets are going this 2025 route, I do think it's a tough sell to the fan base to, you know, run it back with the same roster next year. That's stunk. And just say like, we got Jordy Fernandez as head coach. Like we're going to make improvements. We're going to do all this. Like there's a world where that blows up in their faces spectacularly and it could be pretty rough. But um, last thing that I want to touch on before closing this out, it's the longest podcast I've done in a while, but it's been a really good conversation is Nick Claxton's free agency because, you know, it's been a big t- – it's like the biggest topic of conversation that is going to be resolved, it seems like, at a date that we know when free agency opens on June 30th. When the finals end, because of the new CBA, the Nets will have an exclusive negotiating period with Claxton to lock a deal down. You know, it seems like – and everything I've heard is it's trending towards Claxton coming back to the Nets. 
I just wrote an article about it. The teams that out of all the teams that have cap space, the two that I identified that would make the most sense, you know, to try to make a big offer to him were the Thunder and maybe the Pistons, depending on what they wanted to do. And I think it was um, Bondi who just reported yesterday that the Thunder have real interest in Isaiah Hartenstein and they're kind of the two centers that are viewed as the best. Um, what do you guys make of Claxton's free agency? You know, does paying him a contract that could get over 20 million and approaching, you know, 25 million per year, you know, does, does that make you guys a little nervous or do you even think that like, or do you think it won't even get to that point because there's a lack of competition on the open market? Yeah, it's weird. And I won't steal a little, uh, I will steal a little bit of Doug's thunder because he pointed out how the center position kind of had a bit of a resurgence over the course of the playoffs and players like this maybe are a little more attractive now than they were a season or two ago. When it comes to, I mean, listen, on an individual level, I love Nicholas Claxton, right? And you know, we talk about your path and trying to attract stars here. Well, you know how good he can be alongside star level talent. I mean, he's good even without star level talent. I think when you we talk about this with every single player, Mikhail Bridges out, you know, just miscast here with the role that's being expected of him. I don't think that Nicholas Claxton is miscast, but I think that the roster is poorly built to really maximize what his value is. So when you talk about, you know, 20, 25 million, I, I think the price will probably be higher than most fans would want Brooklyn to sign off on. But barring a team like Detroit coming in and offering an amount of money that just seems absurd where Brooklyn gets the out of saying, well, listen, we, we, did, we did want him back, but that's just too rich for us. Yeah. Again, it's kind of the same thing. You can sign him to a $25 million a year contract over four years, and it won't change anything for your 2025 and how you want to spend your money. He'll probably still be a tradable asset two years from now. I, don't, I see him coming back short of the Nets really pivoting what their short-term agenda looks like here. And yeah, you're going to overpay. And that's kind of, that's what they did with Cam Johnson with his contract. We've kind of seen them do this a little bit on it. And there's some part of me that believes Sean Marks and the Nets look at this as, this is our homegrown guy. You know, we're, we're staking our claim that we've developed this player and he's going to matter to us, especially if we go get a, another player here over the next offseason or two. And, and maybe you get a little little hometown deal because like they invest in his clothing line a little <laughs> off the books and like on, and, uh, yeah. maybe you, you, you everything you matters. Slice a, you slice a few million off that so you can just like do you know the first the series you know, A round of of uh of investing. I do think that the uh, one thing I'll, I'll do I'll go a pro Claxton thing because I think like you you run a little bit of a trouble here if you start overpaying this type of guy. It's just it's just not it's it's just tough I think to just have like you know a twenty five million dollar non-stretch center on your team is yeah. hard. And I think that that's not an anti-Claxton thing. I think it's just like sort of NBA makeup kind of thing. I do think that Claxton got done so dirty this year by the rest of the Nets, uh, the Nets, yeah. the rest of the Nets roster construction, which we talked about many times. He was another massive fallout from like the fact that they didn't have a point guard, right? Yeah. If you don't have a point guard and you have a rim running center, good luck looking good. Uh, like it's just going to be really, really tough when you don't run pick and roll and you have like one and a half guys that can actually do it on a consistent basis. And that I think was something that really did Claxton really dirty. If it was James Harden still as a point guard, I actually don't think we'd be talking about too much. The stats would look sick. He would look awesome in pick and roll. He'd be just this constant lob threat. And we'd be talking all about how like great the switching defense was if the team was near the playoffs. But because they didn't have those other pieces, they trotted out Ben Simmons to play with him every once in a while, which is a disaster. And like all of a sudden he starts looking worse for things that were outside of his control. So while yeah. I think that like paying him a lot is a little bit risky just because of like sort of where he exists on the court. He was another guy who just got, who yeah. really what's, what's the guy supposed to do? Uh, like he, all the things that he does well, especially on offense are negated because you don't have anyone that actually does those things well on your team or like Dinwiddie who refused to do it for, you know, a yeah. long stretch <laughs> I, I <laughs> just because he stood in the corner. <laughs> An exercise that I've played a little bit with Claxton is just like with Claxton and Hartenstein being these two guys who are like the prizes of this uh, free agent center class. Like if you flip those guys and you put Claxton on the Knicks, like yeah. last season, while they do different things, like Hartenstein's a much, much, much better rebounder. Claxton's a much better, um, uh, switch defender, I think probably a little bit better of a lob threat. Like Knicks fans would adore Nick Claxton if you yeah, put yeah. him in Isaiah Hartenstein's place. So there is like a real thing, you know, of, you know, the team was bad last year. And then I also hear a real argument from fans or whoever about, 
well, the team was terrible and he didn't do much to elevate the team and you want to pay him $25 million a year. So like, I get that. But at the same time, like if I'm looking at Claxton and what I'm projecting his deal to be like, the Nets just agreed to a deal with Cam Johnson, which is uh, 40 years, 94.5 million. That doesn't look great right now. Um, but I'm expecting them to like come in somewhere near that ballpark, which the Cam Johnson deal was, I think 23.6 million per year. It averages out to annually. So like 23 million a year, like I think that's in the range. Is that an overpay? Like with the cap about to spike, like deals are going to look differently. Like I'd say it's a little bit of an overpay, but are you going to let that, you know, couple of million dollars, you know, let, you know, make a guy like Nick Claxton go out the door for nothing. I don't think the Nets are going to do it. So. And, and you also had the Johnson contract when you looked at it, you said on average, but you know, it descends down 25, 26. He's only making 21 and a half million dollars. If the Nets are smart with Claxton and you try to put the biggest payout here in this season, just to Which keep a little bit more of that, you know, yeah, keep as much dry as he can for 2025. So you can play with those numbers a little bit too, I think to make it viable. And, and I agree with Doug. It's like, like I, the, this is, <laughs> this is the worst thing that the Brooklyn Nets organization does to the fan base. It makes you slowly start to, you know, go against guys that are great stories, drafted player, developed. Like Nick Claxton is a success story by NBA standards. And yet we sit here and have to be, and again, the money does matter, but you're like, now, now we're talking about his deficiencies and where he's not good enough. And it's like, right, because this team just refuses to figure out a path and stick to it and have these guys fit in where their attributes are most highlighted rather than showing all of their negative attributes and going, yeah, this is why he's not good enough to be X, Y, or Z for this team. So he's a year, he's a year removed from like the defensive player of the year conversation. Not, yeah. he wasn't like there. Yeah. I mean, did he get so much worse or did the team just blow? Okay, yeah, I'm gonna go with the team blue. <laughs> like that, like that's that's yeah. that's the vote I'm gonna take. And I'm not even like the biggest fan of him. I just think yeah. they just you're mad. Adam, Adam is right. They they've done this team. They've done so many of their guys dirty by yeah. just not fielding a competitive team and mm -hmm. being wishy washy about the guys they have. It's like is Cam Thomas starting? Yeah, but we're not sure. It's like mm -hmm. I don't know. Can we make a decision? Because like like could you could you have seemed yeah. to have an idea of what you want to do with your guys? And so. Yeah, I'm no fan of how things have been constructed, but it definitely has gotten in the way of the narratives around some of these dudes. Yeah, so to sum it up, pretty much think that Claxton's going to be back on somewhere in the ballpark of a similar deal to Cam Johnson. I've been looking at my phone a lot because we just got news that Jerry West died, which is yeah, pretty oh, crazy. Damn, that sucks. You know, rough, rough week uh, or a few weeks with Bill Walton and West and some of these guys, and you know, it's been tough, but. And not, not to end on a somber note, but guys, really appreciate you for coming on. I think that was a really good conversation, kind of encompassing a lot of the different angles of where the Nets could go. Really enjoy your work. If you guys, listeners, don't, make sure to follow um, Doug and Adam on Twitter. Also, subscribe to Locked on Nets on their podcast feed because they do great work. I'm looking forward to hearing the many more angles that you guys are able to conjure up on the Nets offseason, you know, in this dead period. and. And I'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it. Yeah, well, so our, our next one will be why why the Danny Hurley things means LeBron James will be <laughs> soon be a Brooklyn net. That's gonna be a go. <laughs> don't worry, we're fine. We're gonna be fine over here. There we we go. can do it. Thanks so much, man. And that does it for this episode of Believe in Nets on the Believe Podcast Network, your one-stop shop for everything happening across the sports and entertainment world. Hope you guys really enjoyed the conversation with Doug and Adam. I think it was a really good debate about all the different paths that the Nets can take this thing and what those different paths might look like in the short and long term. As I said at the top, if you don't already, make sure to subscribe to Believe in Nets on all streaming platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Also subscribe to my YouTube channel at Eric Slater NBA, where I'll be posting all of these episodes as well as other content, film breakdowns, interview clips. Follow me on Twitter at Eric Slater underscore. Also, you can find all of my work at clutchpoints.com for constant news, updates, analysis. We're getting in deeper into the NBA offseason. The Nets don't have any draft picks, but some talk that they could trade in. Then we got free agency right after that. We got trade season right after that. So a lot of different talk about where the Nets are going to go moving forward. And I'll have all that coverage for you here on Believe in Nets. Talk to you guys soon.